welcome to the Columbia Daily Tribune's Behind the Stripes webcast. This is Tribune sports editor Joe Wall Jesper, along with Tribune football beat writer Dave Matter. Dave, we're going to delve into the offensive problems. Now, Missouri had problems in every phase of the game against South Carolina, so um, there's really not... Uh, we, we could do probably a webcast on all of them and fill it out the time pretty nicely. But we're going to focus on the offense because they really... Uh, Throughout the game, never they, they threatened twice, basically to score. They did score twice, but those were the only two drives where they really even threatened. Um, top of your head, let's let's start saying what are some things you think need to change for the offense to work better. Well, you have to take advantage of their strength, and that's these wide receivers. And even though the quarterback, whoever it is, doesn't have a lot of time to throw back there, they've got to get these guys involved, and they've got to get the big, tall, rangy guys that are pretty fast involved somehow. And that's stretching the field vertically throwing some jump balls up there and just seeing what happens. I, I th what At this point, what do you have to lose? Because you're just going backwards on offense or you're throwing three-yard passes mm -hmm. on third and eight. So um, sometimes you just you just got to try. And that's those guys are running deep patterns at times. I mean, we saw it a lot. And, and you talk to the players, uh, they said, yeah, I'm, I'm open. I mm -hmm. was open, but James Franklin just has not been throwing, you know, <laughs> very far past the line of scrimmage. I think it's confidence issues for one, but he did he, against Georgia a couple he times. He did against yeah. Georgia, yeah. Um, but you, you just, for whatever reason, and we all know what happened between Georgia and and mm -hmm. South Carolina. Is the kid was in the middle of the headlines across the country with with the mm -hmm. uh, the uh, idea of him or the story of him not playing. Uh, so I think it's a confidence issue, and he just has to get past that and and throw to those big guys because they can go up and catch the ball. They also are big enough they can kind of shield defenders. I mean, I think that is definitely a thing that I, I think Coach Pinkle, when he was describing the problem after the South Carolina game, just really seemed to be approaching it from a defensive point of view. Like, well, we could throw deep, but then what if it was incomplete? And then it's second and long and third and long, and you're not going to really convert many of those. That's what they already have. It's like, well, <laughs> all right, but you're not converting third and seven after two running plays. You know, I just, I guess I think you have to be a little more of a tack minded team if you're going to run this kind of offense in the first place. I don't think when. They had their good teams that they were so worried about. You know, if we wing it downfield on first down and it fails, we'll wing it downfield on second down too. Um, so I think you got to quit worrying about. I think you you can't coach as if you have uh, Alabama's defense because right. you don't. You've got your defense is fine, but they're not they're not going to hold teams to ten points a game, and you just have to win with your kicking game. I mean, that's just not the way right. Missouri's built. Right. I think too they can mix things up and, and do some more exotic plays. We we saw one that was about to happen at South Carolina where one that uh, did not involve the ball being in the air to Kendall Lawrence. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> but the idea of that, which is something they used to do more with Dave Christensen, and I, I think those are the kind of plays that that excite the players. They they uh, it just seems to give a even if it's only for eight or nine yards, it just kind of gets some morale going. It also gives your opponents something that they have to be ready for. And David Yost typically does not use a lot of trick plays or those exotic mm -hmm. plays. He, he's more about formations and motions and things like that, which is fine, but I, I think you can afford to, to be a little more creative. I also think, you know, we saw a lot of things in the preseason, formation-wise, that we haven't really seen a whole lot uh, in the season so far. And, you know, a lot of those pistol formations where they get the running back going downhill, mm -hmm. I think that worked last year. And obviously they had Henry Josie last year, and he's different than the backs they have now. But I, Kendall Lawrence has been doing a pretty good job. He averaged six yards a carry against a really good South Carolina defense. He has been the most, well, I, can't, I don't want to say he's the most underused because there's a bunch of wide receivers that have yeah. been quite underused. But he's close. I mean, he is capable of, A, making big plays and pretty consistently getting yards, and he's getting less carries than the quarterback. Yeah, are. get him going up the middle, you know, downhill a little bit, and that can set up, you know, some play action stuff that you can do off of that. And also, I think Missouri has gotten away from running good screens. They used to be such a good screen team. And you saw South Carolina run some great screens the other day that just had Missouri's defense totally fooled, it seemed like. Now when Missouri throws a screen, they throw those little slip screens or tunnel screens, and the receiver just gets demolished, you know, two yards mm -hmm. downfield. Um, they, they've gotten away from that. It was so effective with guys like Macklin and Denario Alexander, even Martin Rucker. And, and for whatever reason, they're, they're not doing that as much right now. And, and those are plays, too, where you kind of, you know, you don't need a, a great block from your offensive line. Uh, at least at, uh, on the line of scrimmage, they got to get out in space a little bit. So maybe take advantage of those guys that uh, are not as experienced and maybe not as big and strong and, and can get out there and block. So I would touch on a couple things. Um, we've already mentioned, I, I think you need to take the quarterback run plays and as much as you can, take that decision out of James's hands and run the ball to the running backs with designed running plays. I think when he reads that read option, it seems like he 
maybe is reading it to where almost all the time he's keeping it. Yeah. Um, I know on the goal line one time, he sort of ran into a big crowd. On, when Missouri was operating out of their own goal line, when the, it seemed like the, the give was very open. So that's part of it. I think the other thing is they frequently mention the possibility of, well, yeah, we could keep a tight end in and a running back in to help out the offensive line blocking. But as Pinkle said after the game, well, but you do that and the defense brings another guy in. It's like, well, yeah, but it's like compare playing defense when you're playing one-on-one -on -one in basketball with when you're playing five-on-five. -five. The more congested you can make it, the less room these defensive linemen have. To, right. I mean, I think you want to jam that up a little bit when you're blocking. And I think that the other side of that story is, yeah, but then you don't have five receivers in the pattern. I don't think James Franklin is reading all five receivers. No. I mean, there are, when you look at it, there's usually some open guys. I think he's a guy that's probably going to, if you had three guys in the pattern, it would probably be plenty. I don't think he's getting around to the, you know, when Chase Daniel was here, yeah, he seemed to be able to identify things ahead of time and found the open man. But I think if you can keep a guy in the block, if you can keep a tight end even, I mean, Eric Waters, isn't, they're not throwing the ball anyway. Right. Um, I think those are things, just help out that offensive line a little bit. Because it's the guys coming off the edge that are really killing them. Um, that's what about cost them a fumble on their first drive right. Saturday. That's big. And then I wrote down one other thing. What was it? Uh, was tempo. It? Tempo. <laughs> the times they've had some success, even in that South Carolina game, I thought was when they were just going to their fastball offense where it was just immediately to the line and go again and go again. I think as long as you can sustain that, I would do that because your best friend is going to be defensive linemen who are too tired to rush the passer because then even if you're if you just have traffic cones up there for offensive linemen it's going to take those guys longer to get around them so I think that as much as you can do it I would I would do the up-tempo offense yeah how about this how about get Corbin? James does better than that he does yeah because it's less thinking it's more Good thinking and just play how about this get Corbin Bergstresser and James Franklin on the field at the same time put them both in the backfield um, James, you're revolutionizing the sport James can run and he can be mm -hmm. a runner he can be a power runner and that gives you two threats back there to throw uh, one and a half to run. Berkshire's is not a great runner, but it just gives the defense something else to think about. And um, this is—is uh, is there base offense or just a little? No, play? every once in a while. Mm -hmm. And this this will also satisfy the fans that want to see <laughs> want to see Berkshire on the field. Then then you know you can have it both ways. So I'm sure Gary Pinkle is watching this. I'm sure he's taking <laughs> copious notes. He he thanked us on Monday for all these suggestions yeah. and questions to help his ailing offense. So I, we're we're doing a favor. Well, lastly, we've also had lots of suggestions about how to use DGB. Now let's have a few of those. Um, I'd say throw it to him more. Uh, get him going downfield. He's 6'6". He's super fast. I think he can jump over most guys that, that are covering him. And um, I, I just think you got to throw it to him more. He was out there 26 times, they said the other day. I think they threw to him four times. Uh, and he had one two-yard catch. So uh, I, I'd say just use him more. Well, it's weird because at the beginning of fall practices, he seemed a little bit lost, but then about halfway through, he was like their best, most targeted receiver, and you thought, wow, this this is what we were hearing so much about, and then just the games have started, and it's yeah. not been what anybody had, had imagined. Yeah, and I, who knows what it is. We didn't talk to him on Monday. James Franklin mentioned something about some communication issues with him, so maybe they don't have much chemistry yet. I mean, he was playing with the second team most of camp, so he, he didn't work with Franklin a lot. I think some of that's a little overrated. I mean, it's the same plays. It's not like there's a huge difference between Franklin mm -hmm. and Bergstresser and how they play. So uh, we'll see. I mean, they plan. They want to get him involved. Every week they want to get him more involved, and he's, he's still not producing very much. All right. Well, uh, tomorrow's webcast, we'll look forward to Missouri's visit to Central Florida, which is kind of a, well, not kind of a big game. It is a huge game if Missouri's going to have a winning season. And Missouri, actually, the underdog, right. going into a Conference USA stadium.